Okay, I'm set to go. Um, so uh, we do have uh, quite a bit to cover here. I created um, inventory FAQs page out there on in the documentation underneath the inventory appendix. So when you click on the inventory FAQs, um, these are the FAQs we're going to cover. I'm not going to hit all of them, but I'm going to hit the ones that you probably will get questions on the most. Um, but these are for your reference and for your district's reference um, to go out there and take a look at these and see, you know, what happens if I have to add an item in the of you? You know, what do I do? So these type of questions are answered in this page. So what we're going to do is you guys can follow along by, you know, looking at these questions while I answer them, but I'm going to go into my inventory instance and uh, kind of show you um, you know, where this information is at. So in my instance here, I'm going to move my. Okay. Um, so in here, um, where we're going to start is we're going to talk about items, frequently asked questions. And so uh, we'll get started there and then we'll go into acquisitions, dispositions. I don't know if I'm going to hit anything in transfers, nothing too crazy there. And then just some miscellaneous pending items, stuff like that. So We'll start with items. And so I'm just going to go to the items grid. And um, so what I'm going to touch upon here are just, like I said, some questions that you guys may encounter. And uh, the first question I'm going to tackle here is, what is the recommended way to add an item that was acquired in a prior year? So as you know, Inventory has posting periods, which are yearly. Thank goodness we don't have monthly ones. Um, so you have uh, your open period is basically your fiscal year. And so if that item was really required in a prior year, we haven't put it in, on inventory yet. Um, if, the, I, if the year is a year you can reopen, you can reopen that year and add that item. Now, with that being said, when you reopen, when you reopen a year um, and add that item, and then you close it, number one, it's going to regenerate <clears throat> an inventory report bundle, which I'll talk about here at the end because that's not out there yet, and it's going to um, change possibly life to date figures if whatever you did in that reopen period affected life to date and also um, beginning balances. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind if they want to reopen a period, enter some information and reclose it. Um, if they don't want to reopen a period or if they can't because it's an archived period, then if they need to go in and create an asset that was really acquired in a prior year, they would still use the create, create option here and they would still go in and enter the information. Now, when they do that, the acquisition date on this acquisition window, we're in the acquisition window right now, has to be in the current period. So, you know, if it was, you know, I'm in fiscal year 22. So if I had an asset that I acquired in 21, I still have to put a 22 date in this date field here. Now, when I get to the item information, let's go ahead and add something real quick. Oh, oh. Um, and when I get to the item information, I'm gonna cancel, well, I'm just gonna cancel out of here anyways. But when I get in here into the actual items window, the acquisition date down here can be altered to the actual true date that that, that, that was acquired. Um, so that can be done. But in that acquisition transaction window, it has to be in the current period. Um, if this is also a capitalized asset, so once you complete all of this, you fill it out normally, and you go ahead and you add the item, um, and it is a capitalized asset, 
one thing you want to keep in mind is that capitalized assets are um, are going to show up then on the change schedule reports, like the schedule of changes in um, acquisition, or the schedule of changes, and then the schedule of changes in depreciation. So it's going to show up on those two reports as an acquisition under the acquisition power. If the district doesn't want it to appear as a true acquisition in the current year, what they can then do after they add that item is go into the related acquisition and edit that one. Let's say this is the one I added and go down and click on the error correction box and check that. And then what happens then is when they run those gap change schedule reports, it's going to show under the adjustments column and not the acquisition column. So that's just one thing to keep in mind and it's all documented in, the, in that FAQ. So another question um, that we've received is, what if I enter the wrong tag number? I'm gonna go back to my items grid. And, um, and let's say, you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and resort this. And I entered in a KitchenAid mixer and the tag number was wrong. You know, I already put the tag number on the physical mixer. So I need to change this, no problem. You can go in and change the tag number for any asset, regardless if, you know, it was acquired five years ago or today. Um, you can go in and make a change. All you need to do is go in and edit, modify the tag number and save the changes. Next question, I accidentally added the same item twice with different tag numbers. How do I delete the duplicate uh, item? So if you added um, the same item twice in the same period, and that period is still open, all you need to do is go in and delete it. So here is the delete option. And you'll notice here, like I said, I'm in fiscal year 22. And so I only have two assets in fiscal year 22. I've got um, one in May and one in June. Otherwise, everything from here on down was in a prior year. So, um, and that prior year isn't open. It's an archived period as well. So if I have a situation where, you know, I entered uh, two items, obviously um, I've still had, I must have had access to that prior year to add that duplicate item. Um, so I, like I said, as long as that um, period is open, you can go in, query that tag and delete that duplicate. So you can't delete items from an archive period or a period that isn't open, period has to be open. Um, so what if, um, so what if I do need to delete that item that was in an archived period? I, you know, I, so I entered it twice in, in classic, migrated over, and now I realize oh, it's in there twice. Um, you know, I entered it now and I realized I did enter it in the prior year, which is an archive year. How do I get rid of that when in the archive period? You can't delete it. As you can see, the delete option is grayed out. So in that situation, you need to get rid of that item. Then you will need to go in transactions, dispositions, and create a disposition track transaction against that item to dispose of it. It will create the disposition transaction and then on the related item, it doesn't remove it from the item spread, it just changes the status to disposed of. Okay, my next question. Um, I need to edit an existing item and my gap flag is on. Um, are there certain fields that I cannot change? Absolutely. So I have an asset here. 
And um, this is the one that I created this fiscal year. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go in and click on edit. And so you are gonna see some fields that are grayed out. So um, this is not a capitalized asset here, um, but there are certain things that I still cannot change even though it isn't capitalized. And you'll see here the fund function asset class are not fields that I can, that I can change just on the item record. Because my gap flag is set, I have, if I need to go in and change one of these three, let's say when I created the item, I entered in the wrong function. I have to go in to um, the transactions option. I'm just gonna cancel out here quickly and show you where that's at. Transactions and I need to go to transfers. And I go in here then and create a transfer transaction to change that function to a different one. And when I do that, it creates the transfer transaction and records it here on this grid. And when I go back to the item then, yeah, I'm in a meeting at the moment. And when I um, go back to the transaction here and to the item, then my function will be updated. So it'll actually go in and let's say, you know, it is right now it's uh, 3,100 100, and it should have been 3,200. After I make that transfer transaction and post it, then when I go back in to look at the item, the function will be updated with that new code. Other fields that you can't access, um, the status, we are going to make a change to that one. Um, you should be able to go in and change the status um, of active to new or excess asset or one of those other ones other than disposed of should be able to go in and just change the status to disposed of in here. But all those other ones that I talked about, new excess or excess asset use, um, those you should be able to. So we do have a Jira issue out there, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to um, update this and improve it so that you can change it to other statuses other than disposed of. And also original cost. Gap like is set, you can't go in here and just modify the original cost. So if you know you notice that the original cost was wrong, you entered it in wrong, and you just want to start all over, you can delete this because you're in still in that period, you're in that open period. So you could go in and actually go in, can't slide in here, and delete this transaction. Or if you wanted to just adjust the original cost from 540, maybe it was 1540. Um, you could go in to the acquisitions and create an additional acquisition against this item. Um, and so basically when you go in, you're gonna enter in that tag number, and acquisitions. So that's the tag number. And then from here then, what's gonna happen is I would go in, enter in all the information, enter in the amount. So I'm not overwriting the amount, I'm adding two. So I would put my thousand dollars in here and you'll notice that the update original cost is automatically set. Um, and so you wanna make sure that that is checked. And you'll notice too, once I added that tag number in, it automatically pulled the fund function and asset class from that existing item in here. Um, I can't go in and, and assign a different fund function and asset for each acquisition I post against an existing item. It has to use the same one for the item. Um, and so once I go in and create this then, um, so I would be putting in the thousand dollars here. And once I go ahead and post this acquisition and I go back and look at the item, I will have um, an original cost then of $1,500 instead of just $500. Um, so that's what this will do. And so then you have to keep in mind too, that you now have two acquisition transactions against the item. The one with the original cost, which was incorrect, 
the additional acquisition in which you corrected the amount. Um, and that's okay. I mean, that, that happens. Um, so, so those are your options. You can either delete the item and re-add it with the correct amount, or if you just want to, you know, you don't want to go through all that work and you just want to change the original cost, you create an additional acquisition against that item. Um, another question that um, you may get is in regards to items that are in a lot. And so I'm going to go back to items. I'm going to put them on here. And so here is an item that has, that's really five items. Um, and if you look at, um, it, it is capitalized, and that's because it meets the capitalization criteria. Now, if I would go in and break this down and do a split on this item, obviously, and split it out into five separate tags, they will no longer meet the capitalization criteria. Well, I really don't want to do that because I don't need to split it out but I also don't want this item to appear uh, as a capitalized asset on my gap reports. And so how do I exclude that? So what you can do is go in and edit this item. And there is an entity ID option here, and you can type in whatever you want. You know, just based on, you know, experience in the past, a lot of them will put no gap or none or something like that. And when I save this, then what happens then is when I go out to create my reports, um, I'll just go to uh, access here. There's an option to include or exclude entity IDs. So I can enter in no gap here. And what happens then is that lot of five there that we had will not be included on the gap schedule. Now I know that the Auditor State's Office has um, some rules regarding that. Um, so I believe that it can't exceed like 20% or something like that. I, I think I have that documented in the FAQs. Um, but that is a way for them to exclude those lots on their gap reports. They really don't want to show them as capitalized because like I said, if they split them out, they wouldn't be. Um, so that's the best way to control that. And I know we do have a little bit of a bug here. I think on some of these reports, um, I can't remember which one it was, um, that you know, if you enter in no gap, you kind of get that, it doesn't generate the report and you get an error. So we're working on that. We're aware of it. We've created a JIRA issue for it. Um, I just don't remember which one it was, but it will, um, we will get that fixed. All right. Now, another question that you may get quite often is um, mass updating a specific field on several items. So if you know you're in items and you have a bunch that um, of locations that are incorrect or all of that all of those items in that room have moved to another room. So how do I go in and change that? Well, you could go in and change them manually, but if you're talking you know, 20 items, 50 items, um, that's pretty tedious. So instead, you could query on those. Um, you could query on the sp specific um, location, and that will pull it up then in the grid. So that'll filter it in the grid. And then from there, you can use the export grid items to create a CSV file or an Excel file. I recommend the Excel um, because it um, we'll retain the leading zeros and the tag numbers and in the fund and function and all of that. So I always recommend extracting out with the Excel option. I click on export grid items 
You're going to see two options. I recommend Excel if you're going to be working in that spreadsheet and importing it back in. So once <clears throat> that spreadsheet gets generated then, and you go into Excel and you add all the locations um, for all of those items. Um, so then what you're going to do then is after that's done, you're going to use the system import. And in here, you're going to upload that file. And what's nice is when you do create the spreadsheet from an existing grid, all of the header rows are there in their acceptable format. So that makes it easy. Otherwise, you will want to reference our systems chapter um, in the documentation that has all the file layouts to be used in this import option. And you'll have to create the spreadsheet from there. And it's got all the guidelines in there and what the column header should be and what kind of format they should be in, things like that. So once you know you edit that spreadsheet, you save it as a CSV file. You can't import Excel formatted files in here. It has to be a CSV. You'll get in there if you do. Um, so once you go in and upload the CSV file, you want to make sure that you have the right import type selected. So I went in and updated a bunch of locations. So obviously, um, the locations are stored in my item record. So I'm going to make sure that um, I've got the item import type selected. What we're supposed to say. And also with that as well, we want to make sure that oh, the records, I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback here. Sure that everyone's muted, all right. Um, you want to make sure too that um, the update records is checked as well, because that will then go out there <clears throat> and update the location codes. Okay, any questions so far? Got a question here. Will it export whatever you have in the grid, whether lines are check marked or not? Um, yes. Uh, so, see if I'm understanding your question uh, correctly, Jason. If it's you go back going, to the screen. I'm sorry, Jason, go ahead. If you go back one screen to where the actual button is to do the export. Yeah. The export grid items. I didn't know if you had certain items check marked if it would only export those or it just automatically does all of them. I mean, whatever's on the grid. You want to filter first. So, whatever you're filtered on, whatever's showing. So, if I just type in, oops, and that's my range, and I click on export grid, it's only going to pull what I query. And so all of this information. So if I wanted, you know, um, and you notice too when I start typing in the tag number, it starts to filter. Um, so if these are the particular ones, anything that starts with the 047, let's say the locations were not on there. So I go ahead then and click on export grid item and I select the Excel. And what's going to happen then is it's going to pull all the columns, like if you would have removed any of these columns, deselected them from the more, it, it doesn't care about that. It's still going to pull all the columns, but it's only going to include, pull this up, what I queried on. So I had about 39 items on there. So you'll see, and I use the Excel option here so you can see that, oops, it um, included my leading zeros and things like that. But you'll see here too that it's going to include everything. So that's something to keep in mind as well, um, that you do want to be careful when you go back in and import, re-import the spreadsheet that you're careful about what you change. And so if you accidentally went in and blanked out the organizations while you're working on the spreadsheet, 
and these are all blank now, and you go ahead and import it in, those organizations are going to be overwritten. They're all going to show blank then on the item record. So um, a good practice or what I've done is I've only included the columns that um, I want to change. So in our case with the location codes, I would basically be keeping the record ID, the ID number, which is kind of like the background number that knows you know, which item it's going to um, update, um, the inventory tag, and I would get rid of everything else but the locations and delete everything else and then save that as a CSV file and then load that, import that in. Then I know that I'm only updating the location codes when I do it that way. Just in case I got happy fingers and accidentally, you know, change something else. All right. Um, So a couple of things regarding mass updating um, is, you know, if, you know, we, I talked about in the items record, um, the fun function and asset class aren't things that you can just go in and update on each record. Um, you can mass update those. You can do transfer transactions, but if you have several, that you know you need to update the asset class on, that's okay. You would go into items and still export those out. And you'll notice, you know, once you make those changes to those asset classes on the spreadsheet and you go into system import and you select the item record, you've got a create transfers option. And so what that's going to do is obviously you would leave the update records checked but you also check the great transfers and it will update the asset class on the item and also generate a transfer transaction. Um, so that's out there as well, So that's nice. Um, so that's kind of like doing mass transfer transactions, if you will. Um, when it comes to updating original cost um, via a spreadsheet, um, you could do that as well. Um, so if, you know, you do have, let's say 20 items where the original cost is wrong, um, you could create manual, um, additional acquisition transactions to correct them, or you could pull them from the item grid. And what happens then though, is you're going to have to reformat the headers up top to be accepted as acquisitions. Okay. And so what happens then? So you kind of use that spreadsheet as a template, but you will have to change the headers to be accepted as an acquisition import. And obviously you don't want to update existing acquisitions. You're creating new ones, right? Because you're changing the original cost. So you're putting in that amount you're putting in the existing tags, you're putting in the uh, amount, and then what happens then is it will go out there and create additional acquisition transactions for those existing items updating the original cost. So you can kind of do a, a mass update of original cost if you need to. Um, what if I want to mass dispose? Can I mass dispose? We couldn't do that in the classic. And I, we had workarounds and some of them were painful, but they did work. Um, but um, we do have a way to do that in here for sure. So we do have, again, in the system manager manual, we have a way to go in and create a spreadsheet. Let me go to that because I want to show you something too. Let me go to system and imports. Just to help you along is if I you know, go to a particular area like the dispositions, um, here is you know, the actual information um, showing you the record format. So these are the headers. So you have to have them in this particular uh, 
format. And then they just we kind of give you some hints as to um, um, how to how to make them how to format them correctly. And so for some of these, and I don't think I've done a template yet for dispositions. I need to do that. But what we've done is we have provided a template spreadsheet, and I believe I have it on the items record. I do have an import template spreadsheet if you want to mass add items, um, but I will be working on one for uh, acquisitions and one for dispositions, just haven't done that yet. But basically, you know, you can start by extracting those items out of the items grid that you want to dispose of. And so that can kind of be your base, that spreadsheet, right? like exporting out of the grid. And then when you go in and edit it, you want to make sure that the format <clears throat> has these headers. So you're going to be doing some changing in there, um, but it will include all your tag numbers, you know, that you want to dispose of. So you will be, build, you will be removing columns and adding columns based on your disposition import type. Um, and so you're going to put, you know, fill these in, fill in the necessary information on the spreadsheet. And then in here, you're going to select the disposition and you're going to make sure that update records is not checked because you're creating disposition records. You're not updating existing disposition records. And when you click on import, it will create those dispositions. They will show up under the dispositions grid and on the related item records, they stay out there. They don't get removed. The status changes to disposed of, changed from active to disposed of. So you've got a trail. You've got the trail here of what you did in here to mass dispose of them. You've got the disposition record showing underneath dispositions. And when you go to the related item record, the status of that has changed to a D for disposed of. So you can mass update existing you know, fields already in the item record. You can mass import or update acquisitions, mass import or update dispositions. So those capabilities are out there now that we didn't have requested. Next question, can I delete an item? I think I've already covered this one. Um, delete means remove. And if I go back and, oops, um, you can delete an asset as long as the period is open. So if I created it in 22, and then I realized, oops, this was not met for this year. Um, I need to wait until next year to add it. You can delete it um, by going in and just deleting it here. Um, that will remove it off the system where you can't query it anymore. Um, can you delete an item from an archive period? No. So you can see these were all archived. These all came over from being migrated. Um, I can't go in and just delete it. So I would have to post a disposition transaction. So it'll show, but it'll show us disposed of now. And then we'll have uh, an associated disposition transaction. Next question, depreciation. So my auditor has requested that um, some existing life-to-date depreciation figures have to be changed. So I know that I've had those questions when I used to work for Nawaka. Um, you know, treasurer would, would call or send an email and say, I have three these three tags, I need to change the depreciation. How do I do that? Um, and so you're able to do that in our redesign as well. We did make some changes um, and we had to um, because um, we just allowed you to go in and modify the life to date uh, at any time. Um, and we had to make a change on that because of these um, periods, you know, with you know, opening a new period, what is it gonna do with life to date? You know, closing a period, what's that gonna do with life to date? So what we've done is we've created uh, depreciation adjustment area in the items window. So if you need to 
change depreciation, you have three ways. You can go in and run the depreciate option. If you know the auditor saying it just needs to be fully depreciated, um, you could select that particular item and click on depreciate. And what happens is you can run a projection first and it will show you this is what the life to date was before and this is what it's gonna look like now. And if that looks good, then you would just uncheck this and run it again to actually depreciate the item. So it will depreciate it up to, you know, it's not gonna fully depreciate it. You still have five more years to depreciate on. It's gonna fully depreciate it up to the current period. Um, and so, so it gets everything like back in order, basically. So that's one way to update your depreciation. The other way, and if you know the auditor is saying there is, um, I, it needs to be this specific amount, you could go in and edit. So I'm gonna pick on. And I'm gonna edit it. And this is where I'm talking about, we have done some changes here. Underneath the depreciation information in here, we have added a depreciation transaction. It's very similar to like a budget adjustment. Um, and so in here, it will track any depreciation or adjustments that have been made to the like to date depreciation. So when I click on create, um, because I'm already in fiscal year 22, this is my, it's looking back up here. Let's say I have two periods open. Say I have fiscal year 21 and 22 open, okay? But 22 is my current period. This is based on current period. So it's going to look at it and say, oh, 22 is your current period and that's the, the year it's gonna report it on is 22. Um, and then by default, it's gonna show an adjustment. And then from here, I can put in some type of description explaining why. And then the amount. So whatever amount I put in here is, I believe, going to override. I'm gonna try it. Um, let's see what happens. I'm gonna um, increase it by 500 here. And I think that overrides it. Let me try it out here. It, it adds to it, I'm sorry, it adds to it, which makes sense, it's an adjustment, um, sorry. Um, so uh, so it, it was uh, 427.34 and now it's, uh, I added an adjustment of $500 and now it's 927.34. So if I made a mistake and I put in the wrong amount, I can edit it and change it to whatever it should be and save that, or I can go in and I didn't mean to do it to begin with, I can go ahead and delete it. So you can only delete in that current period. So um, if, you, if you now have 21 as your current period, you wouldn't have been able to delete that. I have to be in 22 in order to edit or delete a depreciation transaction that was performed in that year. Okay, so any questions about this new feature? All right, so like I said, with like today depreciation, you can run the depreciate option, you can do a depreciation transaction, and I believe you can mass change the like today depreciation via a spreadsheet. So um, basically, you know, you would be going in and Querying on those items that you want to mass update the life to date, export that out, make adjustments to the life to date, and then you're going to go back into system import, into the item import, and make sure that update records is selected. And I'm pretty sure it's going to overwrite, it's not going to update. So I had 500 as my life today, and it should be 525. When I put 525 in the spreadsheet, I don't believe it's going to be increasing it. It's gonna overwrite it, and my new life today is gonna to be 525. 
Okay. So those were some of the item FAQs, and these are all listed down here. We broke this out in a table of contents that'll take you right to that section. So all of the information we just covered is in here, plus more. So there's more um, things to, um, and we'll, we'll keep adding to this. Um, if you guys you know, are getting a lot of questions and you're like, could you just add this to the documentation? We'll certainly do that. So, but yeah, this is evolving, this uh, chapter. Um, some of the acquisition FAQs that we have here. Um, how do I add an additional acquisition that um, was really acquired in a prior year to an existing item? So again, I go back. So I already have an existing item out there and I wanna add another acquisition to it. I would just go into acquisitions and I would click on create. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, if, if it was something last year and last year is an archived period, you have to go this route by going in here, creating the acquisition, um, but you're forced to put a date in this period. So I'm forced to put a date in 22. Um, and then I would just continue on and create my acquisition, update the original cost if I need to, but the one thing you want to keep in mind here is this error correction, okay? So if this is part of a capitalized asset and um, you're going in and making a change to this asset and it wasn't something that was acquired this year, it was done last year, you probably want to check that box and make sure that that's marked because what happens then is when you run your gap reports, that amount of that additional acquisition you created is going to appear under the adjustments column on your gap schedules. It will not appear in the acquisition. Now, if you, you know, truly had an acquisition against this existing item in this year, then you wouldn't check the error correction because you want it to appear underneath the acquisition column. So this kind of just really pertains to those items that, yeah, I should have added last year, but I didn't. I can't reopen that year, or I don't want to reopen that year for just this. Instead, I'm just going to create an, action, uh, an acquisition with this year's date and just mark my error correction. That way, you know, it's going to show up underneath my adjustments column. If it isn't a capitalized asset, you really I don't have to worry about it. You don't want to because it's not going to show up anywhere that makes the difference. You know, it's not a capitalized asset. Um, some of the another question is um, we just got this one the other day is when I'm looking at the acquisition transaction, I pull up an existing one. Um, they're like some of these fields aren't um, accessible. Why? Why are they grayed out? And um, that's a good question because, um, you know, I'm looking at one from uh, in a prior period here. And so it definitely, you know, the tag number in here just can't be modified. It shouldn't be. If you're going to change the tag number, it needs to be modified on the item record. When it, when it modifies it on the item record, it'll update the acquisition too with the new tag number. Um, my type, you know, I created this, uh, few years ago as an acquisition type, you have acquisition type and payment types. Um, you know, obviously the date I wouldn't be able to, um, the amount, I, I can't just go in and make a change uh, because it happened in a prior year. And also find the function and asset class. Those are good ones. You know, those are getting pulled from the item record. So whether you added the acquisition this year or in a prior year, you have no access to these because um, those are getting pulled in from the item. So if there needs to be a change made to these, then you have to go in and create a transfer transaction. And when you do that, it's going to update, like if I needed to change the fund, I make a transfer transaction changing the fund, it'll update the item and it will update the associated acquisition with the new fund. So, 
So how do I delete an acquisition I created by mistake? Well, it works very similar to how do I, you know, if I added an item by mistake, I needed to delete it. So if the period is open, you can just go in and delete that transaction. I'm going to go back and shuffle. So you'll notice that, you know, those acquisitions that I added in the current year, fiscal year 22, I can go in and delete if I need to. Um, otherwise, in a prior year, you can't. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that, and I, I don't know if we have a JIRA issue for this. I don't think we can because, you know, work this way in Classic 2. If I go in and let's say I have just one item that I created today or today with one acquisition, and let's say I go in a few days later and I delete that acquisition, it's not going to delete the item because you could have several acquisitions against one item. So it doesn't know that. And so it leaves the item out there now without an associated acquisition. So if this is a capitalized asset, the amount is now going to show up on that um, acquisition prior system startup amount on the gap reports because there's not a related acquisition. So if that happens, you can add the acquisition back in and you'll be fine. Uh, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, it's just because you could have multiple acquisitions against an item. You, know, you can go in and delete that asset or that acquisition, but the item record will still stay out there. So um, if you went in and you had an item that you added four years ago, and it's got an acquisition against you already, and you go in this year and you want to upgrade that item and create an additional acquisition, um, and you went and did that and realized you did it on the wrong tag, that's okay. I would go in and just delete that acquisition because that's not going to do any harm. You just, you know, basically backed out what you underwent. So, and that original acquisition and item are still out there intact, and everything's good to go. Um, dispositions. I know you'll get questions about dispositions and um, how do I, I've, and this always happens, um, I dispose of an asset and guess what, we found it. And, you know, and so that disposition is out there, I need to get rid of it because it really is an active item, we're still using it. Um, so in that case, if that disposition date is in an open period, you could just go in and delete that disposition. Um, so you'll see these are all in prior periods. Can't, but if I you know, created it this year and then we found it three months later, I can go back in and I can delete that. It's still in that open period. Um, if the disposition date is not in an open period and you don't want to reopen the period to delete it, or it's in an archive period and you can't delete it, then you need to re-add the item. So, um, which yeah, classic work the same way. Um, but yeah, you can't go in and delete that disposition. You basically need to go in and add the new item. Probably use the item that has the disposed of status as a template, um, but you need to recreate that item. Can I mass dispose of assets? I think we already touched upon that earlier. So yes, you know, you can go in, like I said, um, create um, the disposition spreadsheet by manually, um, by using what we have out there in the system import chapter, mm -hmm. or you can go in and pull from the items grid, those items that you want to dispose of, make sure that the header information on that um, spreadsheet has the disposition headers on there. So you're gonna to have to make some changes on the spreadsheet. But then once you get that set, enter in the necessary information, then you can mass import and create those disposition transactions. And when you do that, they'll show up under transactions dispositions and the item will then show up as disposed of.
Um, the pending items, and I'm sorry, my files do not have a way to pull from USAS. I don't have that set up. Um, but I just want to talk about some things regarding pending transactions. Um, one of the questions that you may get from your um, districts is, you know, I use the poll from USAS um, and I put in my beginning um, invoice date and it pulled things in. And then I was trying to clean things up and I did a little, I went too far and I deleted items on my pending file that I didn't mean to delete. So how do I get them back on? Well, let me talk about how USAS and inventory talk to each other. And I'll pull that up here. Okay, how does USAS and inventory talk to each other? So in USASR, when an invoiced item meets that pending threshold, it's marked for inventory with a pending status. So that's if you're processing invoices in USASR. It's gonna mark it with a pending status. Now, if you're using a third party to do that, then you need to talk to like um, those third party softwares and make sure that they're marking it when you're doing your invoicing through them like strategic solutions. So what happens then when in inventory, when you're using the pull from USAS to pull those items in, um, it's then going to update the status in USSR, talks back to USSR and says, it's no longer pending, it's been sent. Meaning the items come over to uh, the pending file in inventory. So it changes from pending to sent. And then when a pending item is turned into a tag, so you go in and create a tag from that pending item, um, it's going to remove that item from the pending grid and it's going to talk to USAS again and let them know that it um, is now posted, meaning it's posted as an asset in inventory. So it went from sent to posted. And then if a pending item is deleted, so like in our situation, I accidentally deleted one, um, it is removed from that pending grid. And when that happens, um, so I didn't, you know, turn it into a tag, I have it on my pending file and I deleted it. Um, it's going to change the status from sent to rejected. And so if I went a little too far and deleted some pending items I shouldn't have, then when I am in pending items, I can check mark include rejected and it will pull those items back in. I hope that made sense talking about the status and how that talks to each other. In the pending item documentation too, and there, you know, we talk about the communication between the two in here as well. And then I know we get questions too about here um, regarding um, checking on uh, the status of an item in USASR and seeing if it's been marked for inventory and what kind of um, status is it at right now. Um, if you're having trouble and things aren't getting pulled over and you're like, why? You can use this pending items um, JSON file we have here and pull that uh, report definition in and run it in USSR, and then you'll be able to see the reason why it's you know, not pulling in to inventory. So, and I think I just answered your question, Larry. Yep. So this is the way to do that, is using this report definition. I know that um, we do have a JIRA issue out there too, to, um, you know, some of you say, you know, we never, we forgot to um, set it up when um, we first were in USSR, the uh, configuration set up, we didn't do that for inventory. So, you know, we processed a lot of invoices that were never marked for inventory. Um, how do we go and do that? 
right now you, you can't. Um, so, but we do have a jury issue in your SSR to fix that so that it will go out there, find those, and set that flag to market for inventory so that they can get pulled into the inventory system. Okay. Um, and then I, I know we've gotten the question too, is do I need to pull from UCAS periodically? Yes, you know, if they're going in and, um, you know, they did it, you know, three months ago um, and they want to go in and, you know, pull in more from UCAS, um, they have to go in and put in that date. Now, what's nice though, is you, they're not gonna remember the date they used the last time they pulled from in. And that's okay, because if you're like, uh, yeah, I when I did it before, it was July 1st, I think. And so now it's six months later, and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to start from the beginning of the fiscal year again. That's okay. Um, it's not going to pull everything in again, like it did, you know, at the other day. It's smart enough to remember, you know, it's tracking that, because um, inventory and recess are talking. It is going to know the ones that have already been updated. So it's going to look back at that, you know, communication. Um, and know, oh, okay, this one was already posted as an asset. So I'm not going to go in and pull that, that invoice item back into the pending file because it's been set to posted. Or this one's already been sent. Maybe I didn't create a tag against it yet, but it's on the pending file. So I'm not gonna pull it in twice. So it's gonna look at those statuses on the actual um, invoice item and you know, just ignore you know, the ones that have these sent posted statuses um, and reject it. So it's not gonna include those. So you can you know, go back and use the same fulcrum date um, as many times as you want to, and it's smart enough to pull just the new, quote, new ones. Um, just some miscellaneous things, wrap this up here. Um, I think we already talked about this um, when we were talking about air adjustments, but when we went into the acquisition example, I showed you why you would use um, the air, you would set the air adjustment or the air Correction, and some of them say air adjustment um, flag is because basically you're using it because it should have been entered in a prior year and it wasn't. So it's like I said, most important with capitalized assets. You're going to see this air correction, air adjustment flag in acquisitions, dispositions, and transfers. It's going to be in all three of those. Um, and so if you know that this was something that you should have added in a prior year and you don't want to reopen that period, you'd rather just create it in this period and mark the air adjustment flag so it shows as an adjustment on your gap schedules. That's all you have to do is check mark that box. So like I said, you'll see this in acquisitions, dispositions, and transfer transactions. Um, what makes an item capitalized? Uh, it just depends on what's out here sitting in fiscal year. Um, so it's looking at the dollar and life limit. Um, and so if those get migrated over, pulled over. Um, if not, you can change the capitalization criteria underneath system. There's a capitalization criteria option and that can be changed. Um, to, so if you know they had a board meeting and the board cited, you know, we're going to up our dollar limit and we're not going to have a life limit, um, 5,000 zero, they can go into system capitalization criteria and adjust um, the capitalization and the life limit. And what's nice is it does have a projection. So you can see what items are going to show, no longer show as capitalized basically in this situation. So I have a bunch of items that are now capitalized because um, they meet both of those thresholds. By going and change things and increase the threshold amount, um, then they're going to be items that are you know, no longer going to be considered capitalized. Um, so it's going to show the before and after, basically. And then once they do run the actual run, then um, it's going to uh, 
update those. And what it's going to do then is for those you know, items that were affected, you know, because they were capitalized and no longer, it has to make adjustments um, on the back end to show these are no longer capitalized, the statuses um, or, or you know, the capitalization status is going to change. And those beginning amounts on like the change schedule reports will also get adjusted. You know, now I don't have as much, you know, uh, beginning balances because I have less capitalized now. So it will update those um, and it will decrease those values. And so my beginning balance for this year is going to be different from my ending balance on that same report in the prior year. So those are just things to keep in mind. Um, this also will generate a report. I would recommend keeping the report on hand. We always re recommended that in Classic as well. The districts should have that because the auditors are going to ask for it. Um, it's also audited as well. Um, it wasn't, I don't believe it was audited in uh, Classic. So it will be something that we can pull from um, the audit report in here too, but just be a lot easier to maintain that report that gets run to show this is what I changed it to. Here are the tags that were affected. Makes it a lot easier. Wish list here. Um, tool tips over certain fields, such as original cost and error adjustments. Yes, I know those are things that, you know, we would definitely like to, to add these little enhancements and stuff. I think we might even have a JIRA issue out there, like a feedback issue on that is right at, at already. So that's definitely something we'd like to add to this. Um, And then opening and closing periods. That's just one more thing um, that I want to talk about. Um, and that's just basically, you know, it works very similar to when you open and close a period in UCAS. Um, you know, you open a new period. So I can open 23 if I want to. I don't have to close 22 yet. And I can work in 23 and start adding stuff. But one thing you gotta keep in mind is because I never closed 22, closing a period updates the life to date depreciation fields and it also updates those beginning balances on your capitalized assets. So if I don't close 22, I open 23, I start processing in there, that's fine. And then I run a change schedule report those beginning balances are not going to be correct because I never closed 22. They're not going to be the most current. So it's not going to reflect my 22 amounts. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and so, you know, if they're going in and running reports that make a difference. If they're running a 304, that's fine. I mean, I keep saying 304, I'm sorry. Brief asset listing, um, that's fine because that's just showing you original cost. Um, but when you're running those gap reports, that's when you have to be careful. You know, if you have two periods open and 22 was never closed. Um, let's see. I think the last thing um, I wanted to talk about is just an update on our fiscal year end checklist. So let me go here. And um, it's still in draft form because we do have some outstanding um, options that need to be reports and stuff that need to be done. And I have those in red here. Um, we have a depreciation posting report and they're coming out real soon. Um, the depreciation posting report is coming out uh, on the next release in 23. We still have 22. Um, that's a few days behind. The plan is to get that out today. Version 122 is supposed to go out today. I can't make any promises, but that's what it's scheduled for. 23 then will go out because we're a little behind. 23 should be going out next Friday. That's tentative as well. But on 23, we have this depreciation posting report, which is the equivalent of the EIS closes EIS DEPE project report. And this is just showing depreciation values. 
capitalized or all items. Um, so it's just going to show you what the depreciation, the life to date depreciation is going to look like. Um, so that's what that report will do. Um, the inventory report bundle is what is, like I said, supposed to come out today. And that's the equivalent of classics EISCD. We have about 25 or 23 reports on that thing. Um, we do not have a file archive option in inventory. Uh, and we won't until the document store is set, is done. And that's not scheduled to be done until maybe the end of this year. So for now, the inventory report bundle is going to email you the inventory reports in a zip format. And so that zipped file can then be downloaded and, and saved on a folder on their laptop. It can be forwarded to um, the auditor for them to download and take a look at. Um, but that's how we're handling the inventory report bundle for now. Now, when that document store comes out, um, that zip file that you create should be able to go in and update and load that into the document store. Um, one other thing too is when that document store comes out and you can also go in and reopen 22 and close it, and that will create the inventory report bundle, put it in the document store, and we should have the availability for you to look at those reports via a file archive in the inventory application. I don't know all the specifics right now, um, but that I believe is when that oh, archive section of inventory is going to be available once the document store is set up. So right now, the only way it's going to generate a report bundle, but they're going to be in a zipped format emailed to the treasurer or whoever is responsible for storing them and keeping them. And so users must have their email address on their user record then, correct? We will have a configuration option, correct? And this will all be documented when this comes out to set it up with the email um, addresses. So yes, um, that will have to be set up. Um, so we'll you know, explain all that. And then once that's set up then, then when they close the period, it will get emailed to them. So like I said, that inventory archive is not gonna be out there um, right now. Um, We'll have to just look at their reports, you know, and if they want to generate them, I'm assuming that they probably will because I'm sure there are auditors already at the districts, you know, wanting to review this information. So, and like I said, they could forward that zip file onto them and say, here are all my reports for fiscal year 22. Um, also, I wanted to bring up issues, just the ones that are coming up here. So like I said, cross your fingers that EICD is coming out today. And then the next release, we have the depreciation report I just talked about and the forever waiting of the mass load for new districts. So for those districts that aren't migrating and they're wanting to start new in inventory, you're gonna have a way to mass load your item information for multiple years. So all of that stuff will just get loaded in. So that will definitely be in there. Okay, um, one question that I had for you guys before I ask you, um, uh, before you ask me further questions is, uh, do you, hopefully the session was helpful, just going over FAQs, but would you guys like a separate Fridays with Fiscal just covering the reports, all the reports that are available and where they're getting their information from? If you do, go ahead and post that in the chat uh, because I can probably squeeze in another Fridays with Fiscal this year still and do one on reports. 
So what I would do is just go down through the list of reports. And at that time, I'd probably talk about the report bundle too um, and, uh, and explain, you know, especially the gap reports. I know I do have a couple of these out here going in and explaining where these figures are coming from, how do these get on here and stuff like that. Um, and just talking about all of that. I know, you know, we have some um, newer ITC people that never used inventory, never used classic. And so this is all new to you guys. So if you feel like that would be a good session, you can go ahead and try to get that done. I got a, all right, cool. I will, I will get that scheduled and put that out in the registration page. Um, any questions? Okay, well, I think that's it for today. Thanks everybody for taking the time. And this is being recorded in case there were people that weren't, weren't able to make it. And we'll put that out there um, on the training page. And I hope you guys all have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle.